Welcome back to Worth Here for Woodworking. Today we're going to discuss turning your very first bowl. Now I have a lot of videos out there on advanced techniques and designs and stuff like that. We're not going to cover that stuff. We're stepping way back. For maybe you people that are just getting into the hobby or curious about the hobby and want to know what kind of tools you're going to need and what kind of techniques you're going to have to learn in order to make shavings and turn that very first bowl successfully and safely. And that's the key thing right there. You want to do it safely. But for those of you that are look, looking for more advanced stuff, I'll put links down to those videos down below. So, come along and let's turn your first bowl. Let's start out talking about lathes. Now, most wood turners I know, their very first lathe they buy is generally a mini. In fact, it's pretty much a jet mini. They've been making these things for several decades now. And in the mini class, M-I-N-I, -I, as far as durability, function, performance, that kind of stuff, jet pretty much dominates it. When you step up to the mid-D class, M-I-D-I, -I, which is a little bit taller here, a little bit longer, quite a bit heavier, and they generally have a more features such as reversing speeds and almost all of them are variable speed, well then there's a lot more competition out there. But for your very first lathe, I do kind of recommend a mini, even though I know you will outgrow it fairly quickly. The reason why I say that is the reason most of us still keep them even after we step out to the lathe uh, step up to a bigger lathe is they weren't that big an investment. They hold their value very, very well. I mean, the used lathe market, as long, if you spend less than three quarters of the original asking price, generally you're going to have to put money into it for like belts or bearings or something's going, something's off unless you're just getting a great steal. So buying a new one isn't that big a hardship compared to buying used. They're going to be in the same range. Plus, several times a year, most of the manufacturers have some kind of big blowout sale where they really discount the minis in order to get you into the hobby because they know that you will be buying more stuff later on. The reason why I say get the mini first is it opens up educational opportunities for you. You see, even after most of us step up to these big lays, we hold on to these. We keep them in the shop because they're light enough that we can take them to other turners' houses and stuff like that. And a lot of times our local turning clubs, they might invite people to come in to teach, but nobody's going to have a dozen full-size lays unless you're a professional school. Whereas, you know, if a bunch of people have these mini lays, you can come in, set up in somebody's garage, spread some extension cables out, and actually have a real class with a real professional. Or if you have like a, a kids event, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, you know, just about anything, you can take this out and let kids turn running them just on a th generator. I use these at my art markets turning little tops for kids because it runs off of a generator. It's light enough that it is, I hate to say it, somewhat portable. And that's its advantage. So getting a mini lathe first just kind of makes sense. Now after you get the full size lathe, that doesn't mean this gets set to the side. A lot of people, they'll put their buffing wheels on their mini lathes. So after they turn something, they just have to turn around and they have their different waxes and polishes to polish it everything up. So it will serve a function in your shop even after you have a large lathe. So it just makes sense. Now when you buy a new lathe, this is generally the setup you're going to get with pretty much all the manufacturers. You'll get your lathe and then they'll give you some accessories. The first one being a drive spur. That just fits into the Morris taper in the headstock by friction and that's where all your driving force comes from. It rotates with the lathe. On the back side, they will give you what they call a live center. And this outside will spin, and that gives it that freewheeling action. In the old days, they just took a nail and they would put grease on it, and that would allow for the slippage. But it, it pushes the wood against a drive center and keeps it locked together. But So you want this to be able to spin freely, and that goes into your tailstock and the tailstock is made up of a quill that will go in and out so they can really squeeze that live center with the wood so it drives into the drive center and that will move back and forth on the bed. In between those you're going to have a banjo and your tool rests and the tool rests are fairly small they're going to be made out of iron and you're going to want to modify it a little bit and I'll talk about that in a second. 
Additionally, they are going to give you a knockout bar. And that's because with this Morris taper, these do not want to come out once you've used it for a little while. So you'll be sliding the uh, knockout bar through a hole to knock that out so you can put other things on it. And most of the time, they will also give you a mounting plate, a screw plate. And basically, you attach it wood with larger pieces of wood with screws, and this will screw onto your headstock. There you go. That's generally all they're going to give you. To get going in turning, I'm going to say that you really do need one major accessory along with the lathe to accomplish all the kinds of turning you're capable of, from spindle to bowl to end grain. And that is a chuck. Now my opinion about chucks is you want to buy a really good one. There have been a few manufacturers out there that have been making woodworking chucks for decades. But in the last five, maybe ten years, there's been a lot of other manufacturers that have come out to compete in this market. I'm actually going to tell you stick with either One Way or Vicmark. Because they've been around so long and frankly baby boomers are dying off, you can generally pick these up used for about the price of a lot of the knockoffs new. And the reason why is these last. I know my dad has bought a few of those knockoffs and he hasn't liked them so he passed them down to me and I just don't use them because these they just don't hold their settings as well. They're, they just don't feel as good. I don't trust them as much. Where Vic Marks and One Ways have been around for so long that I trust them. I know that they will last probably my lifetime. They don't ever really need to be rebuilt. You can buy a bunch of different accessories out there. There are some aftermarket stuff like Jaws that because these are kind of the standard, they build them to fit these. So, just spend your money. This is a lifetime investment. I've gone through several lays, but I'm still using the same chuck. So, spend wisely. And when you get the chuck, because you're on a mini lathe, I would suggest getting what they call number three jaws. And they're kind of the standard jaws. They fit like that. You can hold spindles like that. And it's big enough to work with most of the size bowls that you will be using with a mini lathe. Now, most mini lathes are going to be a three-quarter horsepower motor. Some will go up to a horsepower, but that's more than enough for what we're going to be doing because we have the advantage of gears. And most of them I know of have three gears, where a lot of the larger size lathes only have one or two gears, and they depend upon other things to change it. And to change your gear ratio, it's just like a bicycle. You have a gear down below. This one I have it set on the big one down up here and the small one down there. So the motor spins once and this the motor has to spin two or three times for this to rotate once. Whereas if I move it over here, the motor is on a big gear, this is on a small gear, so the motor turns once and this turns multiple times. And you can speed, see the speeds you are uh, capable of. And to change a gear, you have a little lever and you actually lift up the entire motor on this, that loosened that up, and if you if you're changing to a smaller gear, you always want to go down from big to small, whether you're on top or the bottom, rotate it around, then raise the motor up. Sometimes I find it easiest to just to rotate it by hand a little bit to set these belts into these gears. And these gears have little channels that will sit in to get a lot of friction so they don't slip. Then push down on the lever a little bit to stretch that belt just a tad, not much. Tighten it up, close it all up. An upgrade that will make your lathe a lot more useful and enjoyable to use is a variable speed motor. Even though they have gears in different ranges, you can actually change the speed with just a dial. Most lathes do not come with this in the mini class. All you're going to have is three or five gears that you can change a belt on, but being able to change it on the fly is a true luxury and you only pay, you know, 50, maybe 100 bucks for that flexibility. Well worth it, and it will, your lathe will hold its value on the use mark a lot more with that than without. Now, two inexpensive upgrades would be, I personally do not like this cup style live center. because It's actually safer because it has more surface area. 
it will actually push itself out. So you have this little drive center right there that finds a hold and keeps it locked in so the wood won't move left, right, up and down. And then you have this circle ring that actually puts a lot of pressure on it. But because it's wider, you can't get your tools in there when you're making finishing cuts. I actually prefer a cone style live center like this one right here. And you can see the difference at the very end. It just doesn't have too much surface area. And I can get my tool in on these angles to cut that wood. It's just a personal preference, but I like this style. And this isn't that big of an investment. Also, the tool rests. I'm going to use a standard one just to show you the possibilities of a stock setup. Is I've never used this tool rest. When I bought my first lathe, my dad gave me a wonderful present. He bought me a robust tool rest. And yes, I'm name, name brand calling this one out because I think it's probably the best in the industry. It's got a very hard steel rod right there. And the shape of it allows you to get your fingers up underneath it safely and glide smoothly. The problem with these is they're made of iron. And if you ever get a catch or maybe there's a little bit more stress or maybe because your tools are only touching it at one spot, you can dent it. And on my large lathe, I have one of these iron tool rests and I'm constantly having to take a mill file to it. In fact, if you look very closely, when it comes from the manufacturer, it has its mill mark still in it. This is not smooth and you need that smoothness. Listen, can you hear it going over those little grates? So the very first thing you need to do is tune up your tool rest. And that's not very hard to do. Just grab your mill file and come along and smooth it out from top to bottom. And I will kind of roll it over a little bit. And you want to get rid of all those tool marks and undulations and I personally don't like sharp edges, so that's why I'm saying roll it over a little bit. And you can see the difference. See those file marks where I've taken the paint off there, then you have the tool marks. Just file those away so you get a nice round tool rest so it will glide smoothly. There you go. Your tool will now be able to slide instead of da -da 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 -da. Now, besides the lathe, if you're going to stick with turning, you're going to get, end up getting two more power tools. It's kind of like in furniture making. You know, you have your table saw, but along with that table saw, most people end up getting a jointer and a thicknesser. Those three tools kind of go together. Well, in the turning world, a lathe kind of goes with a chainsaw and a bandsaw. They kind of all work together. Now, if you're just starting out and maybe you know somebody that has a chainsaw or access to something, or you can uh, scavenge around, you don't have to get those right off the bat. But you're going to want to do it. Now, if all you want to do is turn, I would suggest getting the chainsaw first because it will allow you the most access to free material. And as you're learning, you're going to, you want to waste a lot of it. You want to make a lot of shavings to get a good feel for it. And everything us turners do with the bandsaw, you can accomplish with a chainsaw. But if you're just kind of in the DIY, you're doing a little bit of everything, I would definitely get the bandsaw first because it's a lot more flexible in furniture making, crafts, and other kinds of stuff. So it's kind of which way do you want to go? Now I do have a video on chainsaw safety and use for the turner. I'll put a link down to that below, but real quickly we'll talk about the bandsaw over here. Now, if you are going to be borrowing it, some tools or actually going to a friend's house and using theirs, which is completely viable when you're first starting out, because you know most woodworkers want to encourage new woodworkers and they don't mind it. And really for wood turning, you're not spending a lot of time using these. You're basically cutting up blanks, you'll cut up six or seven, and then you'll go back to your lathe and you'll spend the whole weekend turning on those. It's not that big a deal. But I would suggest you find out what size blades your friend uses and go buy themselves one. I know my town has a professional tool place where a lot of uh, the shops go to. And a blade like this for this blade, this bandsaw, is only about $13 or $14. And at least if you're going to be 
using their equipment, go get a blade and ask them, hey, is your blade really good? Because some people will spend seventy, eighty, a hundred dollars on them, and as a new woodworker, you don't want to damage that one. So if that's the case, throw your cheap one on and tell them, hey, it's yours as a backup. Go from there. But a bandsaw gives you a lot of flexibility for using scrap material. This was a piece of firewood that I cut up. It was all cracked up. It wasn't sealed properly. It was going to be waste for anything other than a turning project. You see how far in some of these cracks went? Well, on a bandsaw, I can position it and cut it right down that blank and then see. I've got some cracks on the end. But those cracks didn't go too far deep. So this sec center section right here is probably really, really solid that I can use to make my first bowl with. Plus, you know, at firewood, a lot of times it's getting all these pretty spalting action. So you can use free wood that you just find around. I do know when I was first starting out, I could get chunks like this right here from furniture makers because they were the end cuts they were generally scrap for them they were just throwing them in the dumpster but that right there is big enough to make a nice size bowl other people's trash trash is your treasure as a wood turner now my mini lathe its model designation is 10 by 15 which means there is basically five inches from the center of this tip down to my lathe bed so that I can turn 10 inches all the way around the model that preceded was 10 by 14. The difference was the 10 inches designated this way, the 14 or 15 designated this distance. And that naming nomenclature is pretty common out there. But you have to also take into consideration your banjo. If you're wanting to get your tool real close to it because you have a small tool rest, well, you don't have that 5 inches. You only have this far. So an easy way to determine how much of a bowl blank that you can put on something is to use a pair of dividers from your lowest spot up to the center and then make it a little bit shorter. So on a blank like this, I can now position my dividers in the center and see how much I have to take off of this blank in order for it to just fit on my lathe and rotate. So I'm not going for in this example, I'm not going to get a perfect size. I'm just going to cut off the stuff that I know will not rotate around. Now, if I didn't have a bandsaw and all I had was access to a chainsaw, well, I could put this down on a block of wood, maybe secure it somehow. And as long as I cut so that all these little scratches went away, this blank would go onto my lathe. It would just mean that I would have somewhat of an octagon and I would probably lose a little bit of distance to those corners but as long as I have a bandsaw I can cut just inside that curve and it'll work all work out okay the thing is with a bandsaw you have to watch out because you're cutting a curve and a bandsaw is great for cutting curves as long as you understand that the wood needs to feed into the teeth a lot of turners tend to push sideways on the blade and it flexes and puts a lot of tension on it that's what you actually want to watch out for you also do not want to push your hand if you're pushing into the blade rotating it. See how my hand right now is pushing into that? That's just plain stupid and dangerous. The idea would be to come over to the side and if you're rotating it, rotate it around here. So my, if anything happens, my hand goes this way, not into the blade. So I'm going to cut this out as a circle real quickly and show you proper hand placement if you want to cut a curve. In that entire cut, all I was doing was concentrating on getting it entering the face of the blade straight. I wasn't trying to curve it back here to do it. Just focusing on that and making sure the direction rotated around. And this hand was going this way, not that way.
Now, if you watch my other videos, you will see a lot of times I will start out bow turning between centers, meaning I've got my drive spur on this side, I've got a live center on that side, and I will turn it this way. And that's because I'm trying to balance grain and stuff like that. But for your very first one, I would really suggest using a face plate. Because right now we just want to get a successful bowl safely done. And chances are you might make a mistake in this first one. The, set, the face plate is the safest way to do it. As long as you use the right screws. Do not use drywall screws or anything like that. Because these kinds of screws that you're using here are going to be taking a lot of torque. A lot of banging. And it's this, break, this angle, this torsion where they break on you. In fact, if at all possible, maybe go to a store like Fast and all that, specialized in just screws, not one of the big box stores, and go up to the counter and tell them what you're doing and ask for some good solid stainless steel screws. Now, I will admit I'm just using big box stores number 12s, I think, just big monster ones. For the simple reason, I don't use faceplates that often. That's what I have here. But this is one of those do as I say, not as I do. This is not a drywall screw. This is a real screw. And it's got the tapered end so they will cinch down in the holes and center it and give me a good tight bite. And also remember that screws fatigue over time. So don't use the same ones for years on end. You're going to want to get new screws every now and then. Don't want a loose screw. Now, when you mount a faceplate or a chuck, this distance right here is critical. It has to be seated really, really tightly. Really whack it in there and make sure you can't just undo it by hand. Really rotate that in to torque it down. The reason being is even if there's a hairline gap right there, your bowl blank will rattle and things can get dangerous. And if you have a reversing lathe, it will even turn off the lathe. A lot of these things have little screws right here that will help anchor it to prevent that one in case you do screw up and don't seat it properly. But really get it seated tight. Now, what I've just done right here is set up somewhat they, what they call face turning. In that, the, the tree, the other half of this log, the tree grew up and down this way. So I'm actually rotating the tree end over end. I'm not turning it on an axis like that. That would be end grain bowl making because you're turning the bowl into the length of the tree, not the side of the tree. And to start out, go with the side of the tree. It's just a lot easier. But one of the things about face turning is thinking about grain direction is a little bit different. I mean, if you have a board and, you know, we know that the grain is running up and down the tree like here and it's running this way sideways fairly easy concept to grasp so if you ever plane wood you generally want to plane what they call uphill so that you're laying fibers down not lifting them up and what that means is if i have grain running like this right here if i were to plane in this direction well basically i would be cracking these fibers up and there's a chance it will develop a crack will run down into the wood and you get what you call tear out it's really really ugly whereas if i were to plane the wood with a hand plane this way i'm pushing all those fibers down so even if there is a crack it goes up into the wood that i'm already cutting off so it doesn't really matter and it just doesn't crack when you do that one well that's easy to think about when you're talking about 2d surface like the tabletop but when we are rotating something on its face, well, now it's a lot more complicated, sort of. If only you could have a top-down view of your bowl blank, because right now our grain is running like this. You can actually see those fibers, okay? So something you're going to have to think about constantly as a woodworker is how to lay fibers down. For example, if I were to come in this direction, like that, or this direction, like this, all those fibers are being pushed down. But if I were to come out this direction, like that, 
can you see these fibers they want to break off because there's nothing uh, nothing behind them to support them they want to crack off so when you're turning wood you want to think about the fibers more as you're going into the center or coming out to the outside in a bowl you're going down through the center from the outside towards the center that lays fibers down but if you're doing the outside of the bowl coming this way that's the way you lay fibers down because if I were to come this way on the outside of the bowl you can see I'm going against the grain and it's something you just kind of had to think about for a long time but when you're turning your first bowl I suggest trying in both directions because just by feel you will say oh it's easier one way and it's crunchier another way it's generally crunchy when you're coming out because things are splitting off so you're not constantly in the wood something to think about so we've talked about the lathe we've talked about some accessory tools such as your chuck different tool rests the chainsaw and the bandsaw and I showed you how to cut a piece of wood and we actually mounted that wood on the lathe so the last tool we really need to talk about is the bowl gouge and for this entire project as a new woodworker I really do suggest just using one I have a half inch fingernail ground bowl gouge and what they mean by the fingernail grind is how the edge is cut and at the end of this video I will show you how I sharpened it and shaped this this gouge but for now let's just get to the fun part of using it now before we go any further I need to point out that this tool I have in my hand is not a bowl gouge and should never be used on a bowl this is what they call a spindle roughing gouge and yes they both have a u-shape and yes you can grind the wood the tip any way you want the thing is these are made out of flat stock can you see on the ferrule right there it's basically a flat piece of wood metal that is rolled up on the edges and bent to that shape so as it goes into the ferrule it is still flat now in the vintage days that's how they made these tools but that's also when they were working with spring pole lays and that kind of stuff and they really they did it because this was the simplest way for them to make tools a real bowl gouge is made out of a really thick piece of steel and the flute is ground out it's not caused by thin sheets rolled up that adds a lot of strength to the tool the problem is if you've ever taken a tin can a aluminum can and you kind of bend it back and forth to break it in half well this flat piece of metal is going to get torqued over and over and over repeatedly because when you got a tree standing on end and you're rotating it around it's like this well at some point you're going into end grain some points you're going into long grain end grain long grain so you get this vibration that will actually fatigue that metal or if you get a catch and you've got your hand way back here lots of leverage on that tip it could actually snap at the ferrule, spin around, stick in your neck, come out your ear, and put a huge Tarantino splash of gore on a wall. And let me tell you, getting blood off walls is really hard to do. So you just don't want to use this kind of tool on a bowl. This is strictly for spindle turning and nothing else. I also want you all to see something else. Right now, this tool, you can see that the flute is right in the middle and both wings are completely flat. This is what's called an open position in wood turning. To close a position, basically you turn those wings so that you are now perpendicular to the ground. That is 100% closed. So a lot of times you will hear people in videos or in books talk about opening or closing the gouge and what they're talking about is the angle of these two items now why is that important well if I have it completely open right now I want you to look at where the tool is touching the tool rest it's right at the bottom of that gullet can y'all see that 
that is the only point of the tool that is actually supported on the tool rest. If I were to press down on this wing over here, as if I was touching, uh, cutting on this little corner right there, it wants to rotate around. Same thing on the other side. It wants to rotate. But if I press down right in the middle, it's completely stable. So the idea is we want to cut on a piece of the blade that is supported underneath. Now that might mean that if I rotate it over to its side, I slightly close it, I am now being supported right here. It doesn't mean I'm supported on this side. If I press over on this side, it's still going to want to rotate. But if I press right at that spot that it's supported, it is completely stable. It doesn't want to rotate on me. If I press over on this side, it's going to want to rotate over this way. But I want you to notice something. If I get it completely closed, I can st or almost closed, I can still press on this side. It's not supported. I can also press on the top, and it is not supported, and it will want to rotate in. That right there, whenever the tool is actually rotating on its own because something is torquing it around, that's what they call catch. And no matter how you are presenting the wood to the the tool to the wood, the idea is you're wanting to touch the blade on the bottom half, not the top half, because that's the angle of the bevel is being supported there. Uh, the top half will always want to rotate it into the tool. And you want to touch it at a spot where it's being supported underneath. That's critical in all of wood turning, even spindle turning. And the final thing before we start talking about actual turning techniques, your interaction with the tool, the wood, all that kind of physics, is I want to talk about the tool rest placement. Everything we are going to be doing today operates off of leverage. And you can use leverage to increase both your power and your accuracy. You increase leverage by power by giving yourself a large handle. So if I move the back of this handle, if the tip barely moves a little bit, well, that's how you can lift up a car with a jack because you're moving a lot versus a little bit. It's a different ratio. But the other advantage of that one is it gives you a lot of control because a lot of movement back here by a clumsy ox like me translate to minute movements at the actual interaction between the edge and the wood. So you can gain a lot of control by the back of the handle. Problem is, where's your tool rest going to be located? If I've got my tool rest way out here, well then my leverage is a lot less. And actually, these tools are not designed to hang over the tool rest that much because there is so much force right here. You're competing against a three quarter horsepower motor. If you give it the mechanical advantage, it has the power to toss you over. What you want to do is position your tool rest close enough so that you have both mechanical advantage but not so close that you're having to deal with the angles and the bevels of the tool. Because, I mean, you can get real close, but then there's a ramp on the back of the tool, so it's going to be fighting you. You want it securely rested, and you'll find a comfort zone. To me, that's a tad bit close, but I know that after a few strokes, I'll be at my optimum level. By the time I get to this far off of a... a piece of wood that's about two inches two and a half inches I'm going to be relocating my tool rest to a closer angle so that I maintain control because I'm a wimp that way I don't want to have to muscle it and for the majority of the tools that you're going to be using you're going to want to engage the wood just slightly above the center rotation point it'll give you the optimal angle and all its force at that angle is going straight down if you engage it up here, some of the force is coming back towards you and the tool will want to come back a little bit. But in some cuts, you might notice my, my tool starts in the middle and it rises up a little bit and then comes back down towards the center. That's because I'm pivoting off of the bevel at the same time as I'm pivoting off of the tool. And that's the concept called riding the bevel. And it's an easy way to ease into the wood. Now, I want you to think about a hand plane. You have a blade right there. If I were to take the blade out of this and just jam it onto the wood, the blade itself is going to want to dive into the wood. And it kind of it stops cutting after a while because there's so much resistance there. But there's nothing pulling it back. 
The whole purpose of a hand plane is this bottom bevel right there. The blade itself is wanting to dive into the wood, whereas the sole is preventing it from diving into the wood. That's why you get that nice long shaving. It's a balance between going in and pushing back. A gouge is somewhat the same way in that we have a bottom bevel right there where my fingernail is to the edge. That is the sole of our plane. That's what prevents this edge from diving into the wood. Because if I were to just take it and jam it in like that, because that bevel is not touching it, it wants to dive in. But if I were to come over on the side, touch that bevel down, right now it's not cutting because the cutting edge is off the wood. But if I, sl if I push that bevel down and let it kind of glide over the work and slowly raise my handle up until the cutting edge engages, that cutting edge is going to want to push my gouge into the blank. But because that bevel is right there, the bevel is pushing it back. So I find a balance point where I'm just taking nice, thin, wispy shavings. So a lot of times when you see somebody start to cut, they'll kind of back up and you'll see them start right here and then they'll ease into it until they see the shavings. And at that point in time, they will either lock the handle to their hip or brace it around. Another key thing is your front hand, you do not control your tool with the front of your handle. Kind of like when you're writing with a pencil, you write down by the lead. But at this point in time, because of leverage, because your pencil is pivoting off of your web of between your thumb and your forefinger, the leverage right there, you are magnifying minute movements. We want to reduce movements. So this right here, instead of having the pivot point being the web of the hand, we want the pivot point to be up here. Hence, your front hand is really only a back brace to prevent the tool from skating back a little bit, and it gives you a pivot point. And a lot of times, like people like me, we will put our hands on top of it. It's more like a dampening weight where something on this side of the gouge is becoming our pivot point. But our back hand is what's controlling the rotation, the insertion, the angles, all that kind of stuff. The front hand is just kind of a dampening weight and a pivot point, which is why you see some people will put their thumb here and their fingers underneath. The fingers are pressing down, acting as a dampening, and your thumb's right here. The advantage of that one is the shavings aren't coming back and hitting their hand. You'll see me a lot of times wear a glove because I prefer the overhand grip and those shavings come back and hit my hand. But the idea is many times you start on the bevel, you ease the edge into the tool, you have some kind of back pressure to prevent it from skating backwards, and then you use your back hand to control the movement. And speaking of movement, you want to use mainly the big muscles of your body. You don't want to use your fingers to control stuff. These are fine motor skills, but they're also kind of jittery. Your whole body has some mass to it, some more than others. And that mass gives you gradual control. So if you're starting over here, notice your arm might be locked out, but you move your body to control everything. If you're locking it into your body, you're going to lock it in and you're going to move your body. It's big muscle groups that make the smoothest cuts which means that on every cut you have to think ahead of where your body is going to start and where it's going to end for example if i'm making an interior cut on my bowl i know that i'm going to start here and i'm going to end here so i don't want to have anything in my way so i might remove this section right here slide that off and now I can move my entire body. I'm leaning forward, leaning back. I can make the entire movement ahead of time. And that will give me a very smooth actuation at the cutting edge. In spindle turners, a lot of times you'll see it, they'll kind of, I know I'm gonna end up over here, so they'll put their weight on this leg, and then they'll start the cut and they shift their entire body. So that way they know they can make the entire cut. If you're a bowl turner, you might do the same thing. You want to come around the outside, so you shift all your weight on this leg, see? Lift the, this leg, and then you can rotate around, shifting to your other leg 
without really moving your upper body. It's all done with your legs. Have I totally confused you yet? Well, we haven't even made the first cut yet, so that's the teacher's job, to confuse you before you get going. But like everything, once you do that first cut, a lot of these things are going to make sense. But because you understood it beforehand, as your body does stuff and you see the reactions, you understand why it's happening. That way you can build upon it. You can understand when things go wrong better. You've got to understand the physics first before you can analyze what's happening in real life. So let's get ready to do some turning. I want to check that my, my tool rest will come over there. And I did notice I miscut this a tad bit because it would hit on my banjo right there. So I'm going to move it over just to the point where as I rotate it, it doesn't hit the banjo. And I'm going to also make sure it doesn't hit my tool rest and I have enough clearance for it to work. Now, when I'm in this position, I cannot cut the full width of my bow blank because my tool rest is just not long enough. By the time I got to the end, there's a chance it would fall off. But I also know that this is not round whatsoever. So a lot of times the first step is to get a perfectly round blank. And what that might mean is you will only round half of it, the part that's on the tool rest. And once you get that rounded to the point, your banjo is more likely to slide under this so you can get the rest of the bowl blank to the same size. So for most of the cuts today, what we're going to do is we're going to start in a mainly closed position, meaning the tool is not quite at perpendicular, but just slightly off, and we, which means that what's being supported underneath the tool is right underneath the midpoint of my tool rest, right about there. So that's going to be the cutting action, and we are going to be pushing through the cut and it's called a push cut and it's a very safe cut and because we are beginning we're not going to really change that angle up as we go through uh, just get a consistent cut now the first thing you want to do is the bevel that you have on your tool that's how you're going to aim where you're going remember you're gliding that bevel the back of the bevel first and the blade kind of goes forward and that bevel prevents it from diving in so that direction right there is how you aim. So I get my tool in the way I want, then I line that tool bevel up, I see where I want to go, and this is, the pos this is the direction I'm going to be wanting to cut. So I get everything lined up and make sure I can make that movement without stumbling or getting off balance or anything like that. And then we're going to turn the lathe on at our lowest speed, speed it up, Many times I will speed it up until it starts to vibrate. Then back it off a little bit because it's unbalanced right now. Line everything up, get my angles right, and then just make a slow progress through taking a little bit. So as you can see, we've started making our cuts. And I wanted to do this one because when you first start out, that, those first cuts are not always going to be in solid wood. Sometimes you're cutting air. Now, the idea was that we were touching that bevel and then the edge at the same time and gliding through. That was forming our direction. But what you don't want to be doing is pressing really hard against the wood here. It's more of a gliding action. If you press hard, what happens is as it's coming through, all of a sudden you hit air and then your pressure is going to go in and it's going to bang in the wood and you start getting this very violent bang, 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 bang. It's uncomfortable. It's not very confidence inspiring. But if you're just gliding it through using your fingers as kind of a fulcrum and a brace back and gliding forward, well, then it's all going to be smooth because you're not going to be pushing it into the blank space on the air. So let's turn it on and continue our cut. So I'll, I'm going to get my angles just the way I want and then just slowly work my way forward. There we go. Trying not to push into the center of the blank, just keeping it nice and steady. 
So now that we've made that first cut, we've removed some of the material, I can now slide my banjo underneath the entire thing so that my tool rest can go from one side to the other easily. And now I can finish up rounding this entire thing and I can go from both directions. So if you wanted to look at it another way, I come over here and also the more material you, you remove, the less unbalanced it is, the more you can speed it up. And the more you speed it up, the smoother your and more confident the spire your cuts will be. So turn it on, get it to a speed you're comfortable with. Come around, position your angle, your flute the way you want, slightly open, get everything set, and then just make sure you're back so you can move forward in one, in one smooth motion, position, and then just move through. So this will be the last angle we take to see how those initial cuts to round out the whole thing are done. So I have my tool completely closed. I'm going to open it up a little bit. I'm going to aim with the bevel of where I want to go. I'll position my hand so that I can move it and brace it against my body and use my legs to move all the way forward. Turn on the lathe. Raise it up to a speed I feel comfortable with. Position everything and then just move through in a de very deliberate and steady motion. It might take a while because this is underpowered, but you'll get there. So we've made a complete sphere, all except for one little spot right there, which that'll come off when we complete the bowl shape. And that's our next step. Since this is our first bowl, what I want to do next is to cut off this corner at about 45 degree angle. We're not going to try to create a curve right now. I just want to remove this corner. So what did I do? I repositioned my tool rest so it's going in the angle I want and it'll make things a lot easier. Because I can just put the gouge on the tool rest, use my finger right here. This is the fulcrum and a little bit of dead weight. And I just follow that. I can make a nice straight line following this, lining up my bevel in the direction I'm going. And I want you to do two things. I want you to go in different directions. Take a little bit this way, then reverse it. Take a little bit this way. Take a little bit this way and a little bit that way until you come in and you take maybe a quarter of the total diameter off at the angle and I want you to pay attention to what you're feeling when you're going this way versus this way Which cut, which cuts easier? Which has a different smoother feel? Which one do the shavings come off nice and long and crispy? And which ones are kind of crunchy, kind of short? Analyze the difference. But you're not going to have to change the angle. Just set it, just like we did before, slightly open from closed position, aiming with the bevel. And you might want to reposition your tool rest after you cut off a little bit.
So were you able to tell the difference between the cuts? To give you an example, right here I made one cut coming this way and then I made another cut coming back down this way, but I only went halfway. Can you see the amount of tear out, the colored variations? On this one, it gets rough when I get over to the end grain, and there's little bitty holes everywhere. Where in the same spot where I'm going with this direction, it's, it's really smooth. I mean, this is glass smooth to the touch. This feels like sandpaper come around here it's it's fairly smooth right there but it's also smooth right here but I go this far forward and now I'm back to this rough sandpaper and if you look at it you can see a, a lot more of the pores and a lot of tear out now my tools are fairly sharp if yours was just kind of normal you might see larger tear out right there but it's still glass smooth all the way around when I was going this way and and that's the difference between cutting with the fibers and against the fibers because if the fibers are coming this way, if I came up in this direction, all my fingers are getting pressed against each other. But if I came back at this position, they're kind of being spread apart. And they kind of snap off because there's nothing back behind them to brace them up. But what do you think is going to happen in each direction when we start talking about the inside of the bowl? So go ahead and finish off those corners and let's come back. Next up, I want you to kind of take these two corners off right here at half the distance. I don't know what angle that is, but just remove them doing the same exact thing. And on both of these, go uphill. Go with the grain. So now what you have is basically a 16-bit bowl. Straight lines kind of connecting at different angles. So, in one fell swoop, I want to come from this point right here and make a smooth transition all the way around. And how I'm going to do that is with big muscle groups and a smooth transition. So I'm going to position my tool rest so that I can reach from one side and work all the way to the other and keep it fairly tight. I'm now going to position my body so that I can go from one area to the other. Now do all this before I turn the lathe on. So now I can start not quite toward the center and locking everything together, make that smooth motion without really changing my upper body much. And then it's just a matter of turning it on and making the smooth transition cut. Now don't stress out if your shape isn't exactly what you want. Just make a smooth transition. This is just your first bowl and we're just learning techniques. The next step is we want to mount this to your chuck. So we need to create a small tenon. Now in an ideal world we would create a tenon that whenever we closed our chuck down, it would be exactly this size because at that point you get the most contact in the entire ring. But understand, we're beginners. So if we were to make a tenon that when we clamped down was this big, well, we would be getting a lot of contact points at each one of these corners. And for a bowl this size, that's more than enough. So what we want to do is create a tenon that big, but it doesn't have to be all the way back to this back panel. In fact, if it was only a third of the way, that would be perfectly fine because the strength of a tenon is not how far deep it goes, but how snugly it fits along this fence right here. It's exactly the same as when we secured our uh, faceplate to the lathe itself. Any gap in between there causes vibration. If we don't have any gap there, we know we'll get a snug fit. So the easiest way I know to get that perfect size is when you have something this big, just bring it up there and kind of mark it. You'll get a mark right there and you know that's how big you want your tenon to be. So we'll just make it a tad bit bigger. I'm going to turn my lathe on. There's my circle. 
that's my depth. So I'm going to bring my tool rest over to that exact point right there. I'm going to position my tool. It's completely closed now. I'll open it up ever so slightly. I will aim with the bevel going that way. I'm going to place it right on my pencil line. I'm going to turn the lathe on and I'm going to press in and create a nice tenon. Maybe a quarter of an inch. Now all this material over here I can go ahead and take off. So once again, get it closed, slightly open, aim with the bevel, and then just push through. Now the two key things I was looking for in my dovetail was either a dead horizontal edge or slightly dovetailed, just ever so slightly dovetailed, and I wanted a completely 90 degree corner right in here. Uh, the reason why is the strength of this tenon, once again, is not the length of the tenon, but it's that shoulder. You want your, your chuck to be able to get right next to that shoulder all the way around when it's fully tightened. That's where your strength comes from. So now you get to take the bow blank off and sometimes you've got it on so tight and because of all the vibration of cutting is actually tightening it a little bit. You might have to lock your spindle. There's a little lever or button on one side, the pin it so you can lock it in and then just really torque it around to peel this off. Take off your face. Install your chuck. Then you're going to take your bowl blank, really press it in hard, put a lot of pressure there, and then tighten up your chuck. If you end up with any kind of air gap between the shoulder and the jaws, well then you need to re-loosen your chuck, rotate this a little bit so that the teeth aren't biting in the same place, and repeat the process. You just need to be able to tighten your chuck up as tight as it will go, with no air gap whatsoever between the jaws and the shoulder of your tenon. Now many times, even though you've loaded it perfectly and everything's done right, when you turn it on, you're going to notice it's not quite perfectly round. It's at this point in time that you have the opportunity to fine tune your shaping on the back side. Now I would do this with a cut that I call a sheer scrape. Now a scraping action is whenever you take a blade, this is a scraper, and you present it at a less than 90 degree angle so that the wood is kind of scraping off of a burr right there or just a 90 degree edge and the shavings come off. And I'll show you what that's like right here. Just little shavings. But we're not going to use that tool. That was just to show you the example. What I can do is take my gouge and using that lower and interior flute angle if I get that to less than 90 degrees and I touch it off of the tip right towards the front right below center right there because that is what's supported on the tool rest I can get a scraping action now if I raise lower my uh, handle and raise that up, now all of a sudden the wood is passing by the blade at an angle instead of straight at 90 degrees even though the interior angle of the flute is less than 90 degrees. And if you notice the kind of shavings you get off of it are little curly cues. Once again, I have my flute, the lower wing of my flute, and I present that at a less than 90 degree angle. So the wood is kind of scraping off this bottom wing right there. That is a scraping cut. I come along and I am actually touching the wood right here because I'm slightly opened and that's right where it is touching the tool rest. So that right there where my fingernail is, is a supported part of this cut. And that gives me those very nice, wispy shavings, but they aren't curly cues. So if I drop my handle so it comes up and I do that same exact cut, now the wood is coming off of that lower level 
at a slight angle, and that's where you get those curly cues, and that's what makes a sheer scraping cut. So in order to perfect whatever shape I want, I myself am looking up here to see the shape and positioning the lower wing at less than 90 degrees. I'm dropping the handle. I'm locking that into my body so I don't have to watch the tool. I can watch up here. And whenever I touch it, the wood, starting at the bottom and coming up, so I'm going with the grain in a sheer scrape, I will finalize whatever shape I like. And notice I'm getting those wispy curly cues. Warning, never let that top uh, edge even come close to touching. Keep that away, because that will give you a nasty catch. You're working off to the bottom wing. Next up, I'm going to reposition my tool rest across the face and high enough so that my bowl gouge will be touching the center of the bowl whenever it is resting on the tool rest. This itself is not at the center line. The tip of my gouge is. So this is one's height will depend upon if you're using a 3 8 a half inch, what I'm using, or a 3 quarter or 5 8 inch gouge. It will all affect that one. And the first thing I like to do is just even up the shoulder of the bowl. I don't need to square up the entire face, just what's going to be the edge of my bowl. So turn on the lathe, completely closed, open it ever so slightly, point with the bevel, come over where you want, and slowly into the corner. And that's going to be a portion of the edge of my bowl. From there, we want to start removing the bulk of the material in here. And it sounds like we're now doing an entirely different operation, but the cut is still going to be the same. The wood doesn't know that it's a different operation. So once again, we will have the flute completely closed, open it ever so slightly. We're going to be cutting off the bottom wing and aiming with our bevel. And I'm going to create slight V cuts until I start getting close to the edge. And you'll, you'll make sense when you see it. Come in, enter the wood. Small V cut. Don't take off too much. I'm taking off too much there. But I come in where I get close to the diameter of the edge of the bowl that I want. Then come back. Little V cut. You aren't taking a huge bite. It's a little bit of time. And if you do it, you can balance it. But just keep something here to weight it down. And repeat. When you get towards the center of the cone, you can actually just put the tip right in the center. It'll take a little bite and then just work your way down. Work your way down. Now once I get to this point, I'm not but a third of the way into the bowl. So I can reverse it and now go the other way. After coming back this way, I'm only about halfway down on my example, uh, halfway to the base of where I want to be. But before I go all the way down, I want to start thinking about the thickness of the bowl up here. 
because as you the deeper down you go you can't really come back and touch this again because if you make it thin which we're going to have to do because this is a green bowl uh, we're just going to go straight to the finish stage no intermediary intermediary six months of drying we want to make it fairly thin maybe a quarter of an inch and at that thinness it will start to vibrate a little bit so we can't really come back and touch it other than sanding later on so right now you know i'm about three-fourths of a fingernail right there that's probably a half inch and i know i want to be right there so that's a small enough bite that i'm just going to take the whole amount what you don't want to do is take nibble it a little bit you want to take a good enough bite so it's going to feel balanced so turn the lathe on closed slightly open aiming with the bevel come over position it so you can make the entire movement locked in your body you don't have to fiddle around a little bit slowly enter the wood with a good bit of back pressure right when you're first starting out so it doesn't skate on you Once the cut is established, you can reduce this pressure a little bit because the bevel is what's preventing it from moving around. And then just progress down. Aiming a little bit from the outside of the bowl to the inside with your eye to keep, get the thickness even. And then you can check it with your fingers to make sure that the thickness, the thick wall thickness is fairly even. And mine's okay. Uh, you can, you, you actually can't tell if how close it is here, but if it was spreading out, your fingers can tell that they're moving apart. And that's what you're doing when you're moving back and forth. So after that's done, it's just a matter of repeating of coming in close to the edge, maybe coming back, and then making a cleaning cut. You will have to reposition your tool rest every now and then because eventually you're just way too far off of it. Now there are some advanced techniques to really get a smooth finish on the bobs and a lot of people will use what they call a botter feed feeder bowl gouge whose specific purpose is getting that smooth. For, for, but for your first bowl I am going to introduce a second tool and that's a bowl scraper and what it is it's kind of a prolonged round nose. You flatten the edges right there and generally you put this at about 70 degrees and a lot of times I will turn away the heel right there so it's a lot narrower on the inside and that'll put a slight burr on it and you're going to cut with that burr and the key thing is you want to engage the burr because it's rolled back a little bit by leaning forward the, the gouge a little bit and that burr will then cut in and this the in the roundness of the burr becomes the bottom of your plane to push it back so I position this tool so I can get right at the mid range and the tool is angled down a little bit. And FYI, these little mirrors, these little flashlights that I think I paid $5 at Home Depot, little go gooseneck things, has a magnet on bottom. It's really nice getting into seeing your work. So from there, it's just finishing up the interior of your bolt with a little scraping action. After that last pass with a scraper, 
All that's left to do is sand the outside, put a finish on it, and then take the tenon off. And the hard part is taking the tenon off. I don't think I need to show you how to sand. It's just going through the grits, making sure you get the, the making sure you get all the swirls from the previous gear out. And for your first bowl, hey, maybe even not do that one. Maybe just hit it with 220 and don't worry about it. Now to remove the, the tenon, we're going to use an old tennis ball trick. So basically take your bowl out of the chuck. Then go ahead and reduce this to its smallest diameter. And then what you're going to do is you're going to find the center of the backs of the bowl. Many times for me this is a lot easier because I had the center punch from whenever I was turning it between centers. But there will be concentric rings from when you cleaned it up. And then just place your tennis ball there right in the bowl. And then move your tail stock up and put it right in the center of the bowl. Clamp it down and then extend the quill to squeeze that tennis ball flat. That tennis ball will kind of even its pressure out and if it's kind of wobbly a little bit you can kind of tap it to get it centered and then keep tightening. Then it's going to be a matter of making that same exact push cut. You know, having it close, slightly opening it, engaging it just below the tip and making very light cuts to bottom out that tenon and actually make it a little bit concave so that the bowl will be resting on the edge and not the center. And then just take it nice and slow. You're not in a hurry here. This is just to remove the tenon. So don't take a huge bite. This is where I kind of like that cone drive because this is just so bulky I can't get my tool in there very well. And for your first bowl, the last of that, you're just going to either chisel off or get a little belt sander and sand that off flat. Don't worry about getting too complicated on your very first bowl. Oh, and the favorite part, I forgot to turn the camera on, but basically is adding the finish. I like to use a little Mahoney's oil. You don't need to do anything fancy for your very first bowl. Mine was sanded up to about... I want to say 120 grit. You can still see some lines in there, but understand this was just a learning experiment. For most of y'all, this is going to be your very first bowl, and it's something the size that, you know, a nice oatmeal bowl, or if you have some uh, friends that have new kids, this would be a perfect bowl for Cheerios or something like that, or just a little salt pinch or condiment bowl for the table. Or if you're a guy, it's a place to throw your keys in your wallet and your change. So put a little oil on it, let it soak in for about 20 minutes, wipe off everything you can, do the same, repeat the same thing the next day and the day after that, and then you'll be all done. Uh, I like walnut oil because uh, it's a fully natural oil, and Mahoney's process is his a little bit, so it seems to dry a little bit quicker, a little bit harder, but it is going to take, you know, a good week for it to fully cure. And when you put oil in it, you might see a little dark spots here and there where you had a little bit of tear out. But once again, you're learning. It's not that big a deal. We did this fairly quickly. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. And you understand that it really doesn't take a whole lot of tools to make something like a bowl. Uh, right here is all that I used on creating this one. You know, I had my bowl gout, which was the main tool we used. 
I did revert to a bowl scraper towards the end just because I thought that it would be a little bit easier for a new woodworker doing their first bowl to get that bottom thickness as even as it is to do the top because the top's a little bit easier because you can visually see it. The bottom you're kind of feeling your way. Uh, other than that, you know, I had a chisel, a drill press, some screws, a little knick-knack stuff. All I used was 120 grit sandpaper. No big deal. This was just your first bowl. And with all of that, I hope you want to go out and try to make one. I do suggest that on your first bowl, you have an experienced turner around so that you can ask questions. Because there will be things that you might do that... You know, somebody like me on the other side of the camera can't see. <laughs> uh, this is not a two-way communication path. So having somebody experienced there is a great way to do it. I do know a lot of uh, wood turning clubs might have something like a first Saturday where a bunch of the wood turners will get together. Everyone will bring their little mini lathe and we'll, they'll just play for a day. And that's a perfect opportunity to just, hey, go over and say, Hey, could one of y'all teach me how to turn a bowl? And maybe you can use all their equipment. They're, most of them are more than happy to do that one because it gets a new convert into the cult. So please, go out and make a bowl with somebody. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like, favorite, subscribe. Do all those social medias. Maybe forward this to a friend that's kind of interested in wood turning so that they can get a good idea of what it takes. And you can also... Help subsidize me making more of these channels by visiting my website. I run a blog where I write uh, the occasional article. I have an Instagram channel where uh, I do fairly often tips that kind of like this, little sections of these videos. I also have an online store where I sell swag such as t-shirts, hats, some of my own work, stuff like that. All of it really does help subsidize the time I invest to making these kinds of videos. And I want you to remember one last thing in this, that it is always worth your effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.